As you hopefully know, my personal pick for Game of the Year was Gone Home, a small indie title that is just a remarkable feat of design and story because the two are so inextricably linked, it's hard to tell one from the other. After making my pick, it turned out that Steve Gaynor, co-founder of the Fulbright Company, which made the game, happened to be in San Francisco, so I could not pass up the opportunity to sit down with him and pick his brain about a game that has not left my mind since I finished playing it. Now, one word of warning. Go play Gone Home before watching this video. This does deal with all the secrets that are in the game. There's no other way to talk about it. It's a phenomenal game, and you'll appreciate this interview far more having played it yourself. This Game of the Year interview is brought to you by the National Campaign Against Drunk Driving. Drive sober or get pulled over. It is my great pleasure to be with Steve Gaynor, one of the co-founders of the Fulbright Company, makers of Gone Home, my favorite game of this year. Um, thank you so much for your time. Well, thanks for having me here. I'm so glad you like the game. Oh, no, I, I really did. Actually, thank you for the game as well. <laughs> um, but, but before I get to sort of the experience of playing it and some of the, the thoughts that went into it, you come from a traditional tri AAA background. You were at Irrational Games, you were at yeah. 2K Marin. Um, what was kind of the process that kind of brought you to want to go indie and then to kind of pick this game, which is as unique as I can imagine as, as, as your first endeavor? Yeah. Um, I, I, so I worked on, yeah, the Bioshock franchise for a lot of years, uh, like four years, something like that. And, um, you know, it was a really great experience. You know, I, I was on Bioshock 2 really early and saw that game all the way through and led the Minerva's Den DLC. And I worked for a year at Irrational and working with like Ken Levine and all those guys who have been making games that I was a huge fan of for so long. Like it was all a great experience, right? Um, but also those games are really big, you know, and these huge productions and they have to, you know, go out on store shelves and Walmart and all the, there's all this overhead where, you know, after having worked on those games for as long as I did, I just, you know, I had that feeling where it's like at some point you want to work on something smaller, you know, that you can just sort of own in its entirety and it can just be what it is for its own sake, you know, and like find its audience like online on Steam and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, for us uh, at the Fulbright Company, it was a process of saying like me and my other two co-founders, Jonaman Nordhagen and Carla Zamanja, we worked together at 2K Marin. And, you know, I said to them, if I wanted to do an independent thing, would you guys be into that? And luckily, they like quit their jobs and moved to Portland, <laughs> Oregon, and like went all in on it, and that that's awesome. But at that point, we were like, okay, what are we? What do we know how to do? What are we good at? And and what would we want to do creatively with that? And so it was kind of like, well, we have all this experience making immersive first-person games. We like explore and find story, and also like shoot dudes and loot and level up and like <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And and so you know, we were like, well, can we take just that that first part, just the exploration and finding the the story in the world and putting it together in your head and make that the whole game um and that was what led to okay well if we we're going to do that what what form does that take it, it's in a family's house what is their story and it, it became gone home um i mean obviously when you take out the action which is yeah. for all intents and purposes what you guys did that puts a lot of onus on those details, like you, you, yeah. you don't have the benefit of distraction of the combat. It, it, I, I think what struck me immediately about Gone Home is every single part has to work. It's, it's also sure. interconnected, yeah. and sort of if, if, if you're aware of the challenges that this was going to sort of put on just the four of you in, in trying to put this together, I think for for us um, it was it was partly uh, a, a process of of just believing in the the. The potential of that experience, because you know, it it we had had that sort of environmental storytelling experience in a lot of games that we love, and we were like, we always love that part of those games. So we had this confidence that we've seen it work before, and and if we do it well, it can sustain the whole experience. And then the other side of it is, since we didn't have the interactivity of you know combat encounters or leveling up or any of that kind of stuff, we had to make the world and the way that you find the story that much more interactive. So it still feels like a deeply, like constantly interactive experience where it's like, okay, that dresser isn't just for show. You can open all the drawers and you can find a little, you know, object inside of it and actually look at it and touch everything and it's like relevant to, to your experience. Dear Katie, so much has changed, even just since you've been away. 
the, the conceit at the beginning, and I don't think I realized how, how genius it was until it was about an hour into the game, that you are obviously playing a young lady, it's the 90s, you're going back to your family's home, but your family has moved since you've been away at college for a year. Right. So you actually have the same level of unfamiliarity as the character, and I could not get around this sense that I didn't know if I was supposed to be there. Like the, the hairs were just standing up on all, all of my body playing this game. <laughs> I, I I think that you know what we tried to do was walk the line where it's like you know you we put you in a place where you're supposed to be coming home, but there's no one there, so something's not right, right? And and your job, as it were, the thing that motivates you is to find out where everyone went, what happened, and so you know because we wanted to make sure that you weren't just that you did have a reason to be there, that like you had implicit permission to be there, like you're part of this family and these people, you have a connection to them, and that's why you want to find them. And so you're not just purely a home invader, you know, no, like, no, like no. you know, but, but also is there's that voyeuristic feeling of like, I'm in someone's house when they're not home. And it has what I think um, is kind of a familiar feeling of, of, you know, being in a house when it's empty and just feeling a little uncomfortable. And it's just like not quite how you expect that place to be. And so I think, you know, being able to rely on the player's own experience in their life of having been in the dark living room at night and feeling just mm -hmm. kind of uneasy and, and knowing that you could project that into the game, I think was what drove that side of, of like the tension of the experience. I, I think one of the things I, I could see you guys being concerned about is, you find out that your mother's been having an affair, that clearly your father is suffering mental problems, and that your younger sister has come out and is dealing with quite a bit of challenges with that. Yeah. To say nothing of the original owner of the house who had a very challenging life as well, yeah. who has now yeah, passed yeah. away. Um, that has to be something that the player discovers through right. the notes and, and, and figuring out sort of where that secret passage is. But they could potentially not get everything or not get enough to put it all together. Right. How did you sort of strike that balance where you allow the player discovery, but you can be assured that they're gonna discover enough to, to learn something from the game. A lot of it um, actually comes from, you know, my experience on, on the Bioshock series where those games, since they're non-linear, you know, I mean, they're broadly linear, but since they have levels that you can explore side rooms or not, and you can go to different spaces in different orders, and you can miss stuff. It's just like, as a designer, you just have to be comfortable with the fact that people are not gonna see everything and almost certainly not on their first playthrough, and plan towards it, you know, and be like, okay, this has to be, this has to make enough sense that if you only find 80% of it, you can still kind of see the overall shape of what's happening. And you have to prioritize and say, you know, like, for instance, in Gone Home, there are the objects that have Sam's audio diaries attached to them, you know, and those are the most, those are like the spine of the story. Like if you hear those, you know what happened to her and you kind of get the through line and everything else supports that. And so making the things that trigger those audio diaries difficult to miss. So it's like you walk into this room and it's pretty unlikely you're not gonna like touch that thing. You know that feeling where the first moment you see someone, it's like they have a big gold star around them? I, I think this is true for anyone who played the game because there's the rain outside, there, there are those spooky elements, and obviously with the sister having fun with her girlfriend with the Ouija board, right. you don't, it was impossible for me to completely rationalize what was going on because there was that beautiful hint of something supernatural, yeah. and that kept me very engrossed. And I'm, I'm curious how you sort of iterated that so that you, you, you didn't pull a sixth sense, you know, right. at the end, be like, ha ha, it was all this, <laughs> but really we're, we're able to maintain this beautiful tension and mystery. The, the thing that, was, that, that we knew was going to be a challenge from the beginning is in a game, there's no reason that the fiction can't have like supernatural elements to it or fantastical elements or there's zombies or ghosts or, or whatever, but we also knew we want this game to just be about a family in the real world. You know, like that they, they Gone Home takes place in the same world that we live in right now with all the same rules, you know, as far as like, and, and, but I knew that since we were kind of doing a dark and stormy night thing to, to kind of have that tension and, and that feeling of being like enclosed in this space, that people were going to be like, oh, this is going to be a haunted house, you know? And so I, I, I knew that we had to play with that and acknowledge it and not just ignore it. And so we had to do stuff like say, okay, you put a Ouija board in the game and it has a note that, you know, is like, oh, Oscar's communicating with them. And, it, you know, in my head, I'm like, okay, if you 
are in a game and you see that, you're like, oh, maybe ghosts are really here. If you go to you know, your, your aunt and uncle's house and your teenage cousin has a Ouija board out and they have their note and you look at it, you don't go like, I wonder if ghosts are real, you know? And, and so I think, it was, I think it was important for us to put those little signifiers like the red stains in the bathtub and stuff where it's like, we know what you're thinking and we're gonna put these here and then every time we do kind of subvert it and be like, no really, it's just normal people. So that by the time you're in the back half of the story and it's really like coming to a head dramatically, you're thinking about what's happening to the characters, not, yeah. no, but really, when's that serial killer gonna jump out, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Because we kind of have to, you have to diffuse that after a point or I think it just becomes distracting. Going through the house, once you start to realize that there's something that you need to thread together, yeah. I, I couldn't get over how these very mundane objects became so novel. And that, like, it, it really, I mean, it, 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 it's one of those things that art is supposed to do, to sort of take the mundane and, right. and, and sort of just turn it on its ear so you're appreciating it differently. And, like, how much did you guys think about the placement and the objects? I mean, some of it was so so particular to the 90s. I was right. just in love with, 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 with that <laughs> level of detail. But, I mean, it seemed almost shockingly officious after a while once you realize why, that the, those things, even if they're not pertinent to the story, are essential to the experience. Some of it, uh, you know, was, was very much just like, we have to sell the year 1995. So what, what says that, you know, and, and what can say more than just, it's the 90s, you know, so like the VHS tapes that are like hand labeled, it's, we remember it from our lives. But it also got to tell you something about like, well, what are the movies that these characters recorded and are watching? You, like, like you're saying, you can have something that seems very mundane or just sort of mysterious at the beginning. Like for instance, in the foyer, there's that green paper mache skull that's like Dia de los Muertos painted and it's just kind of there unexplained and then near the end of the game in the back half you find like the box that it came in and a note and oh it was from Lonnie when she was in Mexico and she sent it back and like I think that what was important for us was saying anything that's in the game we try not to just have it sitting there on it's just like in isolation but try to have it be part of this web of connections that goes all throughout the house you know where you're like you see something, you don't know what the explanation is, and then an hour later you might find a note that makes you realize it had significance. It wasn't just decoration, you know? Sam. Sam. Hello. Um, the other thing is, you know, there, 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 there are characters in the game, yet they're some of the best characters of the year, yet none of them are present. Right, yeah. And, I mean, it, it, it's, it's quite a feat that just through just the letters and how you sort of each of the father, the sister, and, 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 and the mother articulated themselves that you had a very distinct sense of personality. And I think very much in the case of the sister, which is the emotional thrust of the game, yeah. that I mean, I, I really started to feel for her. And I'm curious sort of how long you sort of worked on that so it didn't seem pat or it didn't seem stereotypical. Yeah. It was, it was definitely an ongoing process, you know, and I mean, a lot of that, a lot of the, I think, empathy for that character comes down to our voice actress, Sarah Grayson, who's mm -hmm. a Portland actor who just, her performance so is lucky. incredible. Yeah. Um, but from the writing side, you know, there, there, was, there was a kind of ongoing process of rewrites and, and stuff, and a lot of it was just a mix of finding the character, you know, and like as you're writing the story and as you're making the game, you're learning more about who this character is. So like after a while, you get a better idea of, oh, they wouldn't really think that about this event in their life. Now that I know them better, you go back and adjust it and make sure that it sounds right for like who they are. And the other side of it is, you know, like as a writer, I, at, at some point when we realized what the fictional premise of the game was, it was like, I'm going to be writing a character that in a lot of ways has a very different ex like life experience than I do, right? Like I've signed up to write a teenage lesbian girl and it's like, okay, I, I've, <laughs> I've been one of those things. I've been a teenager, <laughs> uh, you know? And, and at that point you just have to, as a writer, it's just like, okay, the job is not just to write the character, but to like, do it right and take it seriously and like do your research and figure out how to represent that person's experience that isn't like your own in a way that's like authentic and believable you know so like i read blogs and fiction and nonfiction books and i interviewed people i know in my life about when they went through those experiences and it became you know a synthesis of my own memories of being a teenager and like going out to my first show in the city and then the specific aspects of these other people's lives and how those things, you know, go together between the universal and the and the very, you know, specific personal. Sometimes you just have to lie to mom and dad. Like when Lonnie asked me to see a band with her and stay over at her friend's place in the city after. That's a lie to mom and dad situation. Um, now the game came out 
in the first half of this year. Uh, no, it came out in August. It did come out. So, in August. so just a few months ago now. So well. obviously, it was received very, very warmly. Um, yeah. How have things happened? Sort of like what's 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 kind of the Fulbright Company story since the release of Gone Home? Um, I mean, we are all glad to be taking a little break. I guess <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where like I realized while I was making this game, or when we were coming up to the end of it, I hadn't. I hadn't taken more than like a month off at a time since I started as a game designer, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like because I went from one studio to the other and like Minerva's Den overlapped with the end of the development of Bioshock 2 and it was like just and uh, and so, you know, we're like really grateful that the game has has that people like it and that they're buying it and that it gives us the time just to like step back and like get a little distance, you know, and 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 sort of think about what we're going to do next without having to jump straight into it, you know, because I think that there is a real danger if you make something and then you immediately start making something else, you're still like thinking in terms of that last thing because it occupies your whole brain, you know, like for a while you're you're making it. So for us, you know, we're, we, you know, we've done some support stuff, like we did the commentary mode that, yeah. you know, if, the, if you bought the game at launch, it's now updated with a free commentary Hello, mode, it's like Portal or whatever, you can walk through and hear director's commentary and musicians and the artists on the game talking about it and stuff. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm coming down to San Francisco to talk to people, you know, <laughs> kind of kind of doing the rounds, and then sometime next year we're gonna really get into figuring out what our what our next big thing is. Obviously, congratulations on your successes. I cannot wait to see what you do next. I look forward to talking to you about it when you're comfortable to speak to it. All awesome. right. Thanks for having me. Adam. Thank you very great. much. Thank you. All right, with the interview over, we would like to thank our sponsor, the National Campaign Against Drunk Driving. Drive sober or get pulled over. This holiday season, cops are on a mission to protect the streets from drunk drivers. If you're out at a party or a friend's house and you get behind the wheel of a car drunk, you will not be able to hide from the consequences. You could face jail time, court costs, loss of license, or much worse. Some people might think that they've only had a few drinks, so they're okay to drive, or they say that they've gotten away with it before, and they think that right up until they kill someone. Last year, more than 10,000 people were killed by drunk drivers. So if you're going to celebrate this holiday season, don't be an idiot. Designate a sober driver, call a cab, or use public transportation. It's just not worth it to drive drunk.